Tonight's lecture is happening under the umbrella of two lecture series, Our Path Forward and Horizons. And the reason I think it's so awesome that Janet is here tonight is because we came up with the idea of Our Path Forward together. Our Path Forward is presented to affirm our commitment to public discourse on a wide range of topics with implications for the vitality of our shared democracy. Horizons, a lecture series of the STEAM initiative at the Cambridge Public Library, explores breakthroughs in science and technology and their impacts on society. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Cambridge Public Library Foundation. Our speaker tonight is Ruha Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin is an associate professor at Princeton, where she studies the social dimensions of science, technology, medicine, race and citizenship, knowledge, and power. She is the author of two books, People's Science, Bodies and Rights on the Stem Cell Frontier, published in 2013, which investigates the social dimensions of stem cell science with a focus on the passage and implementation of a right to research codified in California. Her second book, Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code explores the relationship between machine bias and systemic racism, analyzing specific cases of discriminatory design while offering tools for a socially conscious approach to technical development. This book is very timely considering the growing influence of technology in our daily lives. I want to thank Dr. Benjamin for her appearance, and I welcome her to the Cambridge Public Library. Dr. Benjamin. Can you also join me in acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Massachusetts. We acknowledge that academic institutions, public institutions, indeed the nation state itself, was founded upon and continues to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of dismantling ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. With that, I thought we would get started um, in a more conversational mode before I get to my prepared comments because not only here you're here to listen to me, but to also connect with community here, people, other people who are interested in these topics. And so to get started, I'd like you to just lean over, someone behind you, in front of you, introduce yourself. And as you introduce yourself, if you happen to know each other, find someone new. Um, also try to guess, and don't Google, who is the author of this quote. <laughs> All right, it's Martin Luther King Jr., okay? And the reason why we start with this is because it's to show that the conversations that were hap happening, happening now in terms of the ethical, political dimensions of technology have a very long genealogy. And within one of my fields, black studies, the concerns around technology ha are long standing. So we're entering a conversation that's been ongoing and, and trying to build on that and extend that. And so we think about um, machine learning, machine bias, AI, all of the kind of hot topics today. Oftentimes, those are framed in terms of the ethical or social impacts of these technologies. And one of the reframings that I'm hoping my work will do is to draw out the, the dimensions that have to do with power, hierarchy, stratification, and thinking about what does that mean to reframe things in terms of power. So let me start with a story. A few months ago, I was going to speak to students at Harvey Mudd College, which is a STEM-focused school in Southern California. And as I was sort of making my way through Newark Airport, I passed uh, by two men in the, rest, in the restaurant, and one said to the other, I just want someone I can push around, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And uh, being the nosy ethnographer that I am, I sort of made a little note of that and thought, oh, you know, that sentence could end in so many different ways. And I didn't stick around to hear what they were talking about, but I thought it could be in the context of hiring, right? You're sort of going through applications. It could be in the context of dating, swipe right, swipe left. You don't want someone to push you out in that context. So many different contexts. And for me, what was interesting was how this particular mode of power over other people 
has been given new license, free expression. It never, ever went away. But there's a kind of freedom now in the, in the current milieu to just uh, express it in, in, in any, at any point at any time. And there were two things. One, with respect to technology. I'm going now to speak to these students about STEM fields, power, hierarchy. And I thought back to this uh, ad, this article in a 1957 Mechanics Illustrated. And here we have an ad that, that uh, tells us that the robots are coming. When they do, you'll command a host of push button servants. And it goes on, the font is small, so I sort of blew it up for you. In 1863, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves, but by 1865, slavery will be back. We'll all have personal slaves again. Don't be alarmed, we mean robot slaves. And so here you see actually an expression of this, I just want someone or something to push around. It's interesting that it's 1957, a lot changing in the social milieu in terms of women's movements, civil rights movements. So the people who you could count on to dress you, comb your hair, and serve you meals in a jiffy are saying, nah, uh-uh, not anymore. And so in some ways, these servant, servant robots um, become the object in which you can embed that desire to have someone waiting on you. But there's one word in particular in the article that, oh, that jumps out at me. We'll all have personal slaves again, which invokes, it hails a particular public. It tells us in that one little word who this technology is for. Certainly not those who are the descendants of those who were enslaved the first time, right? So both in the output of these servant robots, what they're supposed to do in the world, but also in the input, in terms of the desires, values, racial, social norms that are being embedded in it, there's a lot going on in terms of constructing a particular public for whom this is being designed and the kinds of um, values that they, they, they hope that the, the robot will extend. But the last thing I'll say in this kind of very quick close reading of this ad is that this is only one mode of power, right? We have to remind ourselves that power over others, this vertical form of power, is just one theory, one practice of power. And so for me, it's important to remind myself and to remind all of us that there are other ways to think about how power operates in the world, more horizontal modes of power, empowering one another, a kind of power that doesn't require us to dominate another human being to exercise our own agency and well-being. And I think what, one of the things we have to begin to do is deliberately begin to cultivate alternative forms of power that counter this very dominating form of power that requires some people to be subservient to others. And so with that, a lot of times when I bring up these issues, the first kind of gut reaction is to say, well, okay, maybe if we just diversify the tech workforce, that will lead to these kinds of changes. We'll have different technologies as a result of just changing the demographic makeup of the tech workforce. And it's not to say that diversity in tech is not important, but thinking that that will, like magic fairy does, somehow transform the kinds of technologies that we're becoming accustomed to um, really doesn't hold. Because if you see, this is just one example of many. This um, individual is a computer scientist, I believe his name is Jason Mars, computer scientist, started, had a start, his own startup. And he wanted to change up the voice in the AI for his app. You know, we're a socialized to expect a white feminine voice in our digital assistants, right? We just expect that. He thought, what if I could have a black masculine voice as the voice of my app, you know? That would be cool. It would represent me, right? It would, it would seem to be changing the demographics of who's designing it could lead to that sort of experimentation. But he, he sat back and thought, no, I can't because I think the market would reject it. People would not want to use it because we're accustomed to expecting this digital assistant to take on a very particular race, sex configuration. And perhaps he did focus groups, market research to come to that conclusion, but he stuck with the status quo. So just changing who's doing the designing without thinking about the larger social and cultural milieu in which these designs have to inhabit, that in which they're gonna circulate, is not enough. We have to take, take on a, a bigger framing of, of what various kinds of solutions might be. So now I'm going to turn to more prepared remarks and give you a trailer for the talk. Three main points, just in case 
you get tired, you get called away, your phone starts buzzing and you drift off. There are at least three things that I want you to take home from this, this talk. So first is the idea that racism is productive. Not in the sense of being good, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. We are taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple, in the backwoods, and outdated. Rather than innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, forward-looking, productive. In sociology, we like to say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I'd like us to think about the way that race and technology shape one another. More and more people are accustomed to thinking about the ethical and social impact of technology, but this is only half of the story. Social norms, values, structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impact of technology, but the social inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable. Which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmare that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, and social control. Racism, among other axes of difference, helps produce this fragmented imagination, misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one grounded in justice and joy, we can't only critique the underside but we also have to wrestle with the deep investments, the desire even for domination. I just want someone I can push around. So that's the trailer. Now let's turn to some specifics, beginning with a relatively new app called Citizen, which will send you real-time crime alerts based on a curated selection of 911 calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream, and comment on purported crimes via the app. And it also shows you incidents as red dots on a map so you can avoid particular areas, which is a slightly less racialized version of other apps called Ghetto Tracker and Sketch Factor, which use public data to help people avoid supposedly dangerous neighborhoods. Now, many of you are probably thinking, what could possibly go wrong? in the age of barbecue Beckys calling the police on black people cooking, walking, breathing out of place. It turns out that even a Stanford-educated environmental scientist living in the Bay Area is an ambassador of the carceral state, calling the police on a cookout at Lake Merritt. It's worth noting, too, that the app Citizen was originally called the less chill name Vigilante. And in its rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime but rather now simply to avoid it. As one member of the New York City Council put it, crime is now at historic lows in the city, but because residents are constantly being bombarded with push notifications of crime, they believe the city is going to hell in a handbasket. Not only is this categorically false, it's distracting people from very real public safety issues like reckless driving or rising opioid use that doesn't show on, up on the app. What's most important to our discussion is that citizen and other tech fixes for social problems are not simply about technology's impact on society, but also about how social norms and values shape what tools are imagined necessary in the first place. This dynamic is what I take up in two new books, 
The first examines the interplay between, uh, interplay between race automation and machine bias more broadly as the extension of older forms of racial domination. The second is an edited volume on the carceral dimensions of technology across a wi wide range of social arenas, from more traditional sites like policing and prisons to less obvious contexts like the retail industry and digital economy. In both these works, I'm concerned with who and what are fixed in place to enable innovation in science and technology. How are novel technologies deployed in carceral approaches to governing life well beyond the domain of policing? But also, to what end do we imagine? How can transformation of our political, cultural, and social norms work towards collective forms of freedom? And how might technoscience be appropriated and reimagined for more liberatory ends? In terms of popular discourse, what got me interested in these questions was the proliferation of headlines and hot takes about so-called racist robots. A first wave of stories seemed to be shocked at the prospect that in Langdon Winner's terms, artifacts have politics. A second wave seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And now I think we've entered a phase of attempts to override or address the default settings of racist robots for better or worse. And one of the challenges we face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are used to differentiate us. Take, for example, what we might call an old school targeted advertisement from the mid 20th century. In this case, a housing developer used this flyer to entice white families to purchase a home in the Lemur Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, which is actually where my grandparents eventually infiltrated, which was the, the language used at the time. But at this point in the story, the developers were trying to entice white buyers only by promising them, quote, beneficial restrictions. These were racial covenants that restricted someone from selling their property to black people and other unwanted groups. But then comes the Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, Fair Housing Act of 1968, which sought to protect people from discrimination when renting or buying a home. But did it? Today, companies that lease or sell housing can target their ads to particular groups without people even knowing they're being excluded or preyed upon. And as ProPublica investigators have shown, these ads are often approved within minutes where someone can go in, have their, their advertisement, and exclude or prey upon various eth ethnic groups. Though it's worth noting that in just the last week, advocacy groups have brought the first civil rights lawsuit against housing companies for discriminating against older people using Facebook's ad system. So this combination of coded bias and imagined ob objectivity is what I term the new gym code. Innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. This, as you sort of, some of you will recall, is a riff off of Michelle Alexander's analysis in The New Jim Crow, considering how the reproduction of racist forms of social control in successive institutional forms entails a crucial socio-technical component that not only hides the nature of domination, but allows it to penetrate every facet of social life under the guise of progress. This formulation, as I highlight here, is directly related to a number of other cousin concepts by Brown, Broussard, Daniels, Eubanks, Noble, and others, many of the books on the table out there. This is situated in a hybrid literature that I think of as race-critical code studies. This approach is not only concerned with the impacts of tech, but its production, and particularly how race and racism enter the process. And so in addition to my own work, I really encourage folks to check out these, these other texts. So to get us thinking about how anti-blackness in particular gets encoded in and exercised through automated systems, I consider four conceptual offspring of the new Jim Code that fall along a kind of spectrum, starting with engineered and inequity, which names those technologies that explicitly seek to amplify social cleavages. They are what we might think of as the most obvious, less hidden dimension of the new Jim Code. But even they typically come wrapped in the packaging of progress. So the idea is usually that in order for some people to move forward, others must be contained. Default discrimination are those inventions that tend to ignore social cleavages and as such, tend to reproduce the default settings of race, class, gender, among other axes of difference. Coded exposure examines the way that some technologies fail to see racial difference while others render racialized people hyper-visible and exposed to systems of surveillance. 
And finally, techno-benevolence names those developments that aim to address bias of various sorts, but may still end up reproducing or deepening discrimination in part because of the narrow way in which fairness is defined and operationalized. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna just sketch the last three with a few examples. Default discrimination, again, includes those technologies that reinforce inequities precisely because tech designers fail to seriously attend to the social context of their work, which includes racial domination. Carceral tools that underpin the US penal system are, are key feature of the new Jim Code. At every stage of the process, from policing, sentencing, imprisonment, to parole, automated programs are supplanting the traditional role of humans. There was a study, again, by ProPublica examining the recidivism risk scores assigned to thousands of people arrested in Broward County, Florida, in which they reported that the score was remarkably unreliable in forecasting violent crime, and they uncovered significant racial disparities and inaccuracies, the outputs, shall we say. But what's most concerning, I think, is how it reinforces and hides racial domination by ignoring all the ways that racism shapes the inputs. For example, the surveys given to prospective parolees to determine how likely they are to recidivate includes questions about their criminal history, education, employment history, financial history, neighborhood characteristics, among many other factors. All of these variables have been structured in one way or another by racial domination, from job market discrimination to ghettoization. The survey measures the extent to which an individual's life has been impacted by structural racism without ever asking an individual's race. Colorblind codes like this, surf on the surface, appear better than a biased judge or prosecutor. Next, we turn to coded exposure, which names the tension between ongoing surveillance of racialized populations and calls for digital recognition and inclusion. The desire to literally be seen by technology. Linking historical precedents with contemporary techniques, different forms of exposure serve as a touchstone for considering how the act of viewing something or someone may put the object of our vision at risk a form of scopic vulnerability central to the experience of being racialized. What I'd like to underscore is that it's not only in the process of being out of sight, but also in the danger of being too centered that racialized groups are made vulnerable. In Alondra Nelson's terms, this is a dialectic of neglect and surveillance at work. So that being included is not simply positive recognition, but can be a form of unwanted exposure but not without creative resistance, as I'll come back to in just a minute. But first, a short comedic interlude. Hello, motion sensors, motioning, motioning, please sense me. Let me mention that there's uh, something weird going on with the motion sensors in the lab. Oh, yeah. We replaced all the sensors in the building with a new state-of-the-art system that's going to save money. It works by detecting light reflected off the skin. Well, Lem says it doesn't work at all. Lem's wrong. It does work. Although there is a problem. It doesn't seem to see black people. <laughs> doesn't see black people. I oh, know. Weird, huh? That's more than weird, Veronica. That's basically, well, racist. The company's position is that it's actually the opposite of racist because it's not targeting black people. It's just ignoring them. They insist the worst people can call it is indifferent. Nothing. We never should have let that white guy off. Wait, black men in the elevator. Of course the white guy's gonna get off. Veronica? Oh god, this looks way too aggressive. No, it's okay. I think I know why you're all here. Well, most of you. <clears throat> um, I have something prepared. Um, Veronica, you are a terrific boss. Thank you, Lim. I'll take it from here. 
Let me start by apologizing on behalf of Meridian for this inexcusable situation. I laid in the barn and got pretty good. I figured it was my only shot, so I took the gloves off. Oh, that sounds great, Lamb. Sounds like you gave the company a really strong message. Oh, yeah. yeah. She said they're working 24-7 to make things right. Anticipates everything I need. Plus, he picked up my dry clean. Oh, and he got this kink out of my neck. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, that guy sucks. Well, maybe he's just not using you as right. Yeah, maybe it's on you, dude. Shut up, Stu. I got the worst black guy. <laughs> It turned out Lem had also been thinking about the money issue. And he put together some interesting numbers to show us. And then, we all went to speak to management in a language they could understand. Within a margin of error of plus or minus 1%. And so, if the company keeps hiring white people to follow black people to follow white people to follow black people by Thursday, June 27, 2013, every person on earth will be working for us. And we don't have the parking for that. <laughs> All right, so for me, the show brilliantly depicts how a superficial corporate diversity ethos, prioritization of efficiency over equity, and the default whiteness of tech development work together to ensure that innovation produces containment and that manual water fountain is a great sort of symbol of the new Jim Code. The fact that black employees are unable to use the elevators, doors, turn on the lights is treated as a minor inconvenience in service to a greater good. Finally, some of the most interesting developments I think are those we can think of as techno-benevolence that aim to address bias in various ways. Take, for example, new AI techniques for vetting job applicants. A company called HireVue aims to, quote, reduce unconscious bias and promote diversity in the workplace by using this program that analyzes recorded interviews of prospective employees. It uses thousands of data points, including verbal and nonverbal cues like facial expression, posture, and vocal tone, and compares job seekers' scores to those of existing top performing employees to decide who to flag as a desirable hire and who to reject. The sheer size of many applicant pools and the amount of time and money that companies pour into recruitment is astronomical. Companies like HireVue can narrow the eligible pool at a fraction of the time and cost, and hundreds of companies, including Goldman Sachs, Hilton, Unilever, Red Sox, Atlanta Public School System, and more have signed on. Another value added, according to HireVue, is that there's a lot that a human interviewer misses that AI can keep track of to make, quote, data-driven talent decisions. After all, the problem of employment discrimination is widespread and well-documented, so the logic goes, wouldn't this be more reason to outsource decisions to AI? Well, take a study by Princeton team of computer scientists examining whether a popular algorithm trained on human writing online, um, and they found that it exhibited the same racially biased tendencies that psychologists have documented among humans. In particular, they found that the algorithm associated white-sounding names with pleasant words and black-sounding names with unpleasant ones. And this builds on a classic audit study um, based on old-school types of resumes that we can talk a little bit about when we open things up. So too with gender-coded words and names, as Amazon learned last year when its hiring algorithm was found <laughs> discriminating against women. <laughs> Nevertheless, it should be clear why technical fixes that aim and claim to bypass human biases are so desirable. If only there was a way to slay centuries of racist and sexist demons with a social justice bot. Beyond desirable, more like magical. Magical for employers, perhaps, looking to streamline the grueling work of recruitment, but a curse for many job seekers. Whereas proponents describe a very human-like interaction, those who are on the hunt for jobs recount a very different experience. Applicants are frustrated not only by the lack of human contact, but also because they have no idea how they're being evaluated and why they're repeatedly rejected. 
One job seeker described questioning every small movement and micro expression and feeling a heightened sense of worthlessness because, quote, the company couldn't even assign a person for a few minutes. As this headline puts it, your next interview could be with a racist robot, which brings us back to that problem space we started with. Though it's worth noting, some job seekers are already developing ways to subvert the system by trading answers to employers' tests and creating fake applications as in for formal audits of their own. In fact, one HR employee for a major company recommends slipping the words Oxford or Cambridge into your CV in invisible white ink to pass the automated screening. In terms of a more collective response, a federation of European trade unions called UNI Global Union has developed a charter of digital rights for workers, touching on automated and AI-based decisions to be included in bargaining agreements. One of the most heartening developments to me is that tech industry employees themselves have been increasingly speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism in the form of ICE contracts and military contracts, an important but limited development. And for those of who are interested, check out this hashtag, tech won't build it, among others. This article, published by Science for the People, reminds us, contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history, including engineers and technicians in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, individualism, and reformism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement can draw from these past organizing strategies and challenges in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech today. In a more collaborative vein, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Detroit Community Technology Project offer an even more expansive approach. The former brings together people working across a number of agencies and organizations in a proactive approach to tech justice, especially at the policy level. And the latter develops and uses technology rooted in community needs, offering support to grassroots networks, doing data justice research, including hosting what they call discotechs, which stand for discovering technology, which are these multimedia mobile neighborhood fairs that can be adapted in other locales. And I'll just mention one of the concrete collaborations that's grown out of Data for Black Lives, by the way, which meets at um, MIT Media Lab the last two years. A few years ago, several government agencies in St. Paul, Minnesota, including the, the police department and the public school systems, formed a controversial joint powers agreement called the Innovation Project, giving these agencies broad discretion to collect and share data on young people with the goal of developing predictive tools to identify at-risk youth in the city. There was immediate and broad-based backlash from the community, and in 2017, a group of over 20 local organizations formed what they called the Stop the Cradle to Prison Algorithm Coalition. Data for Black Lives has been providing various forms of support to this coalition, and eventually the city of St. Paul dissolved the agreement in favor of what they call a more community-based approach, which was a huge victory for the activists and community members who'd been fighting these policies for over a year. Another abolitionist approach to the new Jim Code is the Our Data Body, Body's Digital Defense Playbook, which introduces a set of tools for diagnosing, dealing with, and healing the injustices of pervasive and punitive data collection and data-driven systems. The playbook contains in-depth guidelines for facilitating workshops and group activities, plus tools, tip sheets, and reflection pieces, rich stories crafted from in-depth interviews with communities in Charlotte, Detroit, and Los Angeles with the aim, in their words, of engendering power, not paranoia, when it comes to technology. And finally, close to home, the work of my brilliant colleague at MIT, Sasha Costanza Schock, and the Design Justice Network. Among the guiding principles of this approach is that we prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the, the designer. And before seeking new design solutions, we look for what's already working at the community level. Towards that end, the late legal and critical race scholar, Harvard professor, professor Derek A. Bell, encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals, insisting that to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be, which is why I think the arts and humanities are so vital to this discussion and this movement. One of my favorite examples of what we might call a Bellian racial reversal is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-black logics embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white-collar early warning system flips the script 
by creating a heat map that flag flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but includes an app that alerts users when they enter high-risk areas to encourage citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design the algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. <laughs> Not surprisingly, the average face of a criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like this are only comical if we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. By deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this manner, analysts can better understand and expose the many forms of discrimination embedded in and enabled by technology. And finally, for those interested, that St. Paul Coalition I mentioned is hosting a webinar on October 7th for anyone interested in contributing to a heat map that will track data sharing platforms like the ones they organized against, empowering local communities across the country in a data for public good campaign, tracking the trackers, as it were. So if, if as, this, as I suggested at the start, the carceral imagination captures and contains, then an abolitionist imagination opens up possibilities and pathways. It creates new templates and builds on critical intellectual traditions that have continually developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. May we all find ways to build on this tradition. While you would normally begin by directing questions or comments to me, I'm gonna ask you just to take a few minutes. Again, turn to your neighbor, check in, pick one thing, one slide, one image, one example, how it resonated, and have a little chat. For me, the reason why I have written these books um, are to provoke community discussion and reflection and organizing and so on. And so it's very um, encouraging for me to hear how things are landing, what it's making you think or do. And so you should feel free to ask questions, ask it of the room, ask it of me, but also feel free to just think out loud about um, the conversations that you were just having with your partner. One of the silver linings, we could call it, in all of this is precisely the way that technologies are reflecting back at us our own patterns that we often are unwilling to reckon with, right? And so if someone were to tell you, you know, I have an example over here, um, you know, black women are routinely discriminated against um, because of our hair uh, and in workplace, in social settings, and you come up with all kinds of, oh, maybe that's just in your head, maybe you don't really, Maybe you're not thinking about, you know, they didn't need to do that. But then when you do a Google search and you put in professional hairstyles and most of the images are white women, you put in unprofessional hairstyles and most of the images are black women with their natural hair, in some ways it offers a mirror back to us about things we're unwilling to come to grips with when a human being tells us. And so I think that's why that show Black Mirror is aptly titled. It's this idea that you're, we're looking at ourselves through a reflection of these technologies in a way, whether that has to do with historical patterns or not. The other sort of subtext of, um, you know, the, the question had to do with, or the comment had to do with intentionality. You know, how do we think about racism? And I do think the dominant way that we're, you know, a, accustomed to thinking about racism is both interpersonally and it's out of malicious intent. You mean to do harm. You say a racial slur or you uh, commit some kind of aggression. And partly what I'm trying to do in Race After Technology is to get us thinking in a post-intentional analysis of technologies. Some of this may very well come out of, especially the engineered inequity examples, which I didn't get into, a very deliberate attempt to reinforce hierarchies and create digital caste systems around the world. Um, but the vast majority of this um, is either not thinking about hierarchy at all or trying to actually undo it. So the intentions don't actually often match up with the effects. And so we come back to the context of just social interaction. One of the examples I often give my students is, you know, if someone's outside stealing my car, I don't run up to them and say, oh, do you, do you feel in your heart like you're a thief? I mean, do you identify with being a thief? No? Okay, you're good. I look at the effects of their actions. I look at what they're doing in, out in the world, right? If my car is gone, then, you know. Um, but oftentimes with social harms, 
We measure the extent of the harm based on whether the person identifies as a racist or a sexist, right? Is it, and then we look for it in their heart. Did they mean to? Did they have a, a black friend? Oh no, then that couldn't be. That couldn't be. Did you hear the feedback? Is it, so this is one of those things in which our approach to social harms doesn't match up with how we often treat other kinds of harms. And so in some ways, we want to look at the effects of these technologies rather than try to go and dig into you know, the identities of the designers and whether or not people are mean to do harm. And in many cases, it is the training set. In many cases, it is the training set. In many, many cases, it has to do with the institutional context in which a particular automated system is being um, rolled out. One of the things I would have us really pay attention to is the way that automated decision systems are enabling all kinds of policies um, around austerity and cutting social benefits and public benefits. There's a report that just came out in the last couple days um, that I, I tweeted and I put, everyone should read this so you should be able to find it, um, that shows that in Michigan and other states, um, the adoption of these automated systems um, are, are, have, have created the context in which tens of thousands of people have been cut off from unemployment um, benefits or food stamps. Um, it, erroneously, through various kinds of um, mistakes in the, the, um, the actual um, programs. And so it's interesting how these are being adopted as a way to cut people out of various kinds of public benefits. And I think we have to pay attention to, to especially that. We might think of as algorithmic austerity um, uh, policies. Thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, so as a researcher, I am fascinated, and as a human, I am horrified. Um, and you said we could talk about anything, so I'd actually like to draw attention to a technology that I'm studying Please. and get your thoughts on it. Okay. Um, so I do research on prescription drug monitoring programs. Mm -hmm. um, they are um, they're basically two-tiered surveillance technologies. They allow healthcare providers to see opioids and other controlled substances that their patients have been getting, and then they allow law enforcement to see both what those patients have been doing and what providers have been doing. So they're used in different ways in the healthcare field and in the criminal justice field. Now, my dissertation was looking at how pharmacists make decisions about providing opioids before PDMPs even existed. And most of what they told me about how they make those decisions are, you know, they get a gut feeling. Somebody walks in and they get a weird feeling, and then that's how they know that that person's probably abusing medication. And of course, I'm a sociologist, so I think, well, is that gut feeling because you're really good at differentiating people, or is that gut feeling race, or is it class, or is it gender? And so when I heard about prescription drug monitoring programs, I thought, okay, these could be the great equalizer. Yeah. Because if providers check every single patient who walks in the door, yeah. they're going to be really surprised when the middle class white suburban yeah. mom is actually stockpiling Percocet. <laughs> um, but if they're only checking those people that they get a gut feeling yeah. about, then all they're going to do is reinforce their existing stereotypes. Yeah. And so I'm curious, with a technology like that, which you know, it doesn't track race, it tracks gender, and it yeah. tracks zip code, and it tracks age, but it doesn't have any measure of race, and it doesn't track refusal, so you can't tell if discrimination is happening or not. I'm curious about how you think about that um, with regard to your the framework that you've created. Yeah, no, that's a great example, and I, and I definitely would have to kind of learn more about the nitty gritty to give a, a really informed comment about that, but it reminds me about another example that I have read in um, more closely, a kind of digital triaging of patients. And if you want to sit down, feel free. Um, and this paper is going to come out in science in the next couple of weeks. But it's one of these examples in which an automated system is used to identify patients that need more attention from nurses, from staff, as opposed to the vast majority who they can sort of get the, the, the normal treatment. And so it's to see where they should pool, put their resources. And with a particular um, you know, um, algorithm that was developed, it was based on training data that looked at where money was spent more, on which kinds of patients money was spent more on, as a, as a predictor on where the t attention should go. And so on the surface, in the same way yours is, it seems to be a more objective. It's not relying on the gut feeling, the, the subjective assessment of an individual healthcare practitioner decide, okay, are you telling the truth? Should I actually give you more you know, attention in this program? Um, but what the, re the, the, I think they were a, a team of computer science and economists found is that because on average, 
white, we spend much more money on white patients. That, as that training data was fed into the algorithm to make decisions, then white patients were also being identified more for the, the, the resources in the future. And so race is nowhere in the mix. Cost became a proxy for where they should identify. But because cost historically is racialized in terms of how much we spend on people, that prediction was then, and so what they specifically, they found that a black and white patient with the same uh, risk score, whether, let's say, the risk score says you don't need more resources. Black and white patient at the same score, the black patient is significantly sicker than the white patient. And so they go into depth and look at that, that proxy of cost and they do a really fine grained analysis. And so this paper, um, let me try to remember, I think the lead author is um, Obermeyer um, in science will come out. But I think that will, it could inform the way that you're also thinking about this other kind of health assessment tool in the way that it's, it's non-racial, but how other variables are racialized and are then used in order to sort patients and how that could do the work. And then the danger for me is always that at least with health practitioners, we have a we have an informed suspicion that they might be prejudiced or they might, there might be some bias involved. But you kick a system in and people are like, oh, this is an objective triaging of patients. And so we're less likely to question um, the way that the, the bias is built into the various um, the judgments that are, that are built into the program. So I've been thinking a lot about like, cursor reality and space. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also, like this presentation makes me think about the ways in which Technology, particularly technology being the state, can kind of expand that carcerality from just not like outside of the prisons and outside of yeah. the police force, but you know, electronic monitoring and all those different things. Um, but I'm curious about uh, what your experience may be like looking at tech in countries that are less invested in racialized carcerality mm -hmm. and whether either the uh, tech globalization of tech mm -hmm. and exportation of US tech has kind yeah. of made those societies more yeah. uh, interested in incarceration by default, or yeah. if there's kind of a subversive other type of tech yeah. that's already currently existing outside of that kind of paradigm. Yeah, no, that's a really important question. And, and it dovetails with this one about, you know, kind of a call for more research. Because there are a few cases that I talk about in race after technology that takes a take us outside of the US context. Um, the Indian biometric system and the way that that's reinforcing certain kind of caste hierarchies, the fact that everyone has to have a national ID card that's a biometric sort of surveillance card, but many groups are um, being denied various kinds of public benefits because they don't have the card. Um, the case of the Muslims in China, which you see headlines about all the time, but the way that um, the citizen score and the kinds of surveillance that are happening there are creating wreaking havoc on the, the, so, the, the, the point being that whatever the salient social hierarchies in a society are, that's where we have to look at the way that technology is shaping that relationship. So the new Jim Code invokes the history of racial domination in the US and so I want us to think specifically about this context, but there are many other books that I mentioned and work that I'm encouraging for people to take these broader questions about power and technology and situate them in other regions and other locales to think about and not simply to look for races as it manifests here, right? But to think about what are the salient hierarchies in a given locale and then how it's being deployed in that context. And so again, I have very short sort of case studies um, discussions as a provocation to say we need more work, we need more work on, on this. My question is, how do we, yeah. uh, at an academic level, maybe even from, from early on, get you know, social context yeah. included in our education? Because you know, if, you know, once yeah. you get some, if, when you're actually writing the code, if you're not thinking about it. I know, you know I know. Sorry, so that's like one of my, that's one of my main soapboxes, uh, education and pedagogy as a ground zero for change. So we think about the different things that ha we have to address. We, we have a lot of cool, great things happening in the context of litigation. We have lawyers who are, who are working on how to build cases that litigate algorithms, algorithms that have these huge consequences that are often behind firewall that you can't actually look at the, the, the system itself. And so you have litigation, you have legislation. Here in Somerville, you had the ban on facial recognition, San Francisco. So you have policies and laws being passed in various places. 
Um, you have organizing, tech workers, right? So that's a whole nother, and community organizing, black, uh, you know, Detroit community. So that's a whole nother arena. But then for me, like my main base is thinking about education as a site of change. Like what are the things we have to change, as you said early on. So it's the reason why I've been spending a lot of time with K through 12 teachers and thinking about how to see these ideas and integrate this. You know, in the last few years, we had a, had a huge push of girls who code, black girls code, everybody code, right? Um, as a, a way to think again about diversifying the tech workforce. Um, but if we're only trying to cultivate technical skills without a critical literacy, without a critical understanding of how to question technology, not just sort of implement the, 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 the directions others have created, then not only are we kind of doing a disservice, a public disservice, but if we think about how other professions, the more a profession is feminized, or more people of color go into it, the status of that profession actually goes down as a function of who does it. You get paid less, it's seen as less, less prestigious, and we're very likely to see that in terms of programming if we haven't already, right? And so that's another thing, is that based on precedent, that's not actually going to save us. It's just diversify. But going to your point about thinking about what would need to change, there are efforts underway. The more people are recognizing the importance of developing um, a kind of social analysis of, of all of this. And so in the same way that we have public interest law, there are centers developing around public interest technology, right? Because in many ways, technology produced in the private sector, they, they have vast public policy implications but the decisions are happening behind closed doors. Like no one voted for these guys, but the decisions that they make are having all of these ramifications. And, and so it's like they're, they're operating without a mandate in that way. And so what would it mean to develop public interest technology and what kinds of interdisciplinary centers? And there are some, and it, it, it's exactly to this point that it can't be a kind of token ethics class that's optional thrown on to the end of something, right? Because the things that we make optional in academia, it says a lot about how we value it or not, right? Like not everyone has to do it, so it's not essential. Um, and so there are, including at um, you know, my institution and others, um, people think about what, how do we have to reorganize this? But in doing so, we have to be very clear-eyed that there are deep-seated knowledge hierarchies in the academy. Even our language of hard science, soft science. Like we, Though we fool ourselves if we think that you know it's just every, you know everything is all about knowledge is value. No, some has much more prestige, legitimacy, power in um, in the academy resources. And so, as we try to develop these spaces uh, in which we have uh, new kinds of um, pedagogy and training, we have to reckon with the way that some people's way of knowing and approaching and quantifying and reducing and abstracting the world has much more authority than those who are trying to contextualize, situate, criti be critical about. And so it's not going to be easy to kind of form the, these, um, these more integrated sites of knowledge production. But I have to tell you, almost everywhere that I speak, I have students in engineering, computer science, get up calling for this and, and sort of demanding it. And so which tells me, and we think about, you know, rather than thinking about you know, knowledge in academia as a kind of consumer model, like you're a customer and you're just there to pay the bill, pay the check and get what you got. Like thinking about actually shaping the nature of, of what you're getting. And I see that happening in medical schools. You know, in the last few years I've been brought into various medical schools of students saying, these people are not training us to be good health professionals. They're not talking about racism and equity. Like they're giving us degrees, but we don't feel equipped to actually be healthcare practitioners in the world, right? And so the students themselves are demanding more of the administrators and the, and, the, and the faculty. One organization that I really love is called White Coats for Black Lives. It's a national network um, in which the, this student network, um, they have created report cards for the institution. So they go and they measure whether the extent to which the institutions are actually addressing X, Y, and Z when it comes to structural um, embody racism and so on. And so they're issuing report cards the last couple of years. And so it's changing the relationship, right? It's saying, no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna measure me, I'm gonna measure you. <laughs> Whether you get me ready, you know? And so my hope is that, oh, you know, as we move, um, students will be less, it'll, it'll be less about like just your own personal education, but thinking about, you know, in terms of a, a, a national network, perhaps, 
of engineering students or computer science students that see that their work is having these huge sort of policy and you know social dimensions of what would it take to actually demand more of the institution rather than waiting for them to create something that you think is 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 worthwhile. And so that's part of the, the organizing and the movement building that I'm hoping um, more people sort of get on. Hi, um, Hi. I uh, love your work. Uh, computer you. science was amazing. It's highly informative during my undergraduate years. Oh, um, I actually my background is in political science, but I fell in love with technology policy. And because I wanted to be literate in it, I started taking engineering classes in college so I could understand what people were talking about. Um, so now I work in the technology industry um, in the self-driving car space, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm learning, you know, firsthand what the black box looks like. Right? You know, Audubon Bismarck says you don't, you know, you don't want laws are like sausages. You never want to see them being made. Um, technology is a little bit like that too, yeah. I think, because it instills a sort of understanding of the, the fragility mm -hmm. of the things that you know are going out. Right? So you, there's a reason why we're getting software updates on our phones, for example, because Absolutely. they need to be updated. Um, so my question to you, you know, is sort of twofold. The first of which is about this point that you make about technology policy and technology mm -hmm. law, mm -hmm. right? And right now, you know, the biggest fine that I've seen um, that has been put against a technology company was that, you know, 1.2 billion fine against Google earlier this year mm -hmm. for a total of, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of $9 billion. That mm -hmm. hasn't really deterred them from, you know, their discriminatory practices mm -hmm. because they have a valuation of over $800 billion, yeah. right? Um, and you're, you're seeing, you know, these people um, who are working in Congress, who are, are already largely ineffective. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're left to local and state authorities, yeah. you know, to legislate for technologies, and yeah. there's new types of technologies every day. Yeah. And those policy members don't have the critical literacy of those technologies in order to properly evaluate them. Yeah. So my question to you is, how do we create a technology policy that is grounded in ethics, yeah. and is grounded in the social context, yeah. in a world in which we have so many things to grapple with, while at the same time have so few people who are curious about the implications, yeah. but who also have the literacy of them. So yeah, that's like a mil one of those million dollar questions, dissertation level questions, I would say. Um, and one of the things I just want to like point out in the framing um, is the role of local and state laws and policies. Because one of the things that I understand is that many times the technologies that are developed are developed for the most restrictive context, so it can be rolled out you know, across the board. So we shouldn't minimize the importance of creating uh, a stricter legal environment, policy environment at the local or the state level. And that's something that you know, companies are reckoning with, I think, in European data privacy context. And so um, you know, I don't have a kind of broad mandate, like this is what we have to do everywhere, but I just want to encourage um, work that is being done. And one of the, I think, strongest bases of this for those who want to connect up with, with what's happening is ACL, Massachusetts ACLU the office here is really taking charge in terms of um, advocating and working on certain kinds of um, policy changes. And so um, Cade Crawford is, is the person there to look up and think about like how to um, connect up with those who are thinking seriously about, about the question that you just posed. And curious about, uh, you mentioned a case specifically about uh, a data sharing agreement in local government. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that like as a data person, you know, more data can give you more informed yeah. uh, answer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not naive enough to think that that's yeah. a neutral answer, but uh, I'm curious about um, how, I mean, it seems like it's a political will question, right? Like if I tell you that this data yeah. says that, you know, these students are yeah. underperforming on these metrics, like yeah. it's your choice whether to you know, give them better guidance yeah. counselors and better teachers or to remove funding from yeah. uh, really critical um, services. Who controls the data? Who's wielding the data? Who's making decisions based on the data? And so like that St. Paul group that I mentioned, they're not opposed to data collection, but they're rightly suspicious of a collaboration between the police and the public schools where there is no, like they, they lack trustworthiness in terms of what the social infrastructure in which the data is gonna be used. So I think it behooves us to always think about the context in which data is created and gonna be used as part and parcel of the discussion, not simply trying to isolate the data in and of itself. And so 
um, an example that I give towards the end of the book um, are putting these two apps side by side. One is an app, so both apps on the surface seem like they are um, helping um, address issues of prison overcrowding and decarceration and so on. But then when you look at the social infrastructure in which the apps were developed and being used, they're quite, they're quite different. One is um, based, is largely funded by Jay-Z, and it's a kind of startup, you know, venture capital um, app in which it will uh, allow people who are, have been uh, um, charged with a crime not to, be sit, not to sit in a cage, but they will be surveilled, right? So the, the app will pro provide data and monitoring for law enforcement and very likely provide other grounds to lock people back up. There was a report in California that looked at um, youth who have electronic monitoring and found that the vast majority of them were locked back up because of technical violations connected with having an ankle monitor, not based on any pre-existing laws that existed. And so this particular app is actually serving and surveilling um, the existing sort of carceral apparatus, and it's called Promise, versus an app called Acolition, which is a play off of the word abolition. And in this case, the app allows any of us who download the app to donate our spare change when we make purchases to a bail fund that will be used by community organizations to bail people out. And then it's a, it's a kind of recycling app. So it never, the money never is, is invested back into the carceral system, but like an endowment, it can be reused. And so this app draws on a pre-existing network of community organizations who are already working on um, developing bail funds, and they're the ones who control how, how the money is used and when it's used and so on. So when we begin to see something that on the surface seems like, oh, these two things are pretty much the same, you know? Um, but then you look at the social infrastructure, who created it, with what values and what networks are gonna be deploying it. I think that's at the level when you think about whether more data is good. I think we should always have a question mark behind that because as the St. Paul you know, um, example showed, Data can be used um, as a weapon, you know, to, to, to reinforce certain kinds of um, harms, in this case, you know, at-risk youth, you know. And so, um, you know, I think that the, part of what I'm just encouraging us to do is include the social context in our analysis of whether, you know, data or technology are, are um, a form of public good or not. Thank you for that. Throughout your talk, I was kind of wondering a lot about the, the technologies that we're talking about. And I think a lot of this technology that, that you've spoken about is centered around adults, although mm -hmm. besides mm -hmm. what you're talking about in St. Paul, mm -hmm. but focus on adults. So like um, targeted ads mm -hmm. and um, you know, apps that, that mostly adults use. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of wondering, especially as you're teaching college students, mm -hmm. um, these are people who have been inundated with technology since the day they were born. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking about that aspect, that mm -hmm. they, these are, the younger generations are now, they're interacting with these technologies all the time um, for their entire lives. And yeah. I'm wondering how that's shaping their, yeah. their biases, shaping you know, both implicit and explicit biases. Um, and then I started thinking about technologies that are actually aimed towards children and yeah. whether you, you see these same patterns in, in apps for kids or in you know, YouTube kids or things like yeah. technologies like that. A couple things that come to mind like, with that question. One is a, a story that I tell um, towards the end of the book about engaging with um, Yik Yak, which w it went out of business. <laughs> so it was an app that was a kind of uh, geolocated, like you could only post if you were within a certain radius of a place, and so that it was often schools and students that were engaging this. So when I first got to Princeton, it was a big deal at that time. And my students were like, oh, you gotta see what people are posting on Yik Yak, gotta see, what, especially the racist content. And so I logged on, I created an account, and within like a couple of weeks, I was like, no! I just couldn't stay on it, because one, it's anonymous, and it's all people around you. You know, unlike the comment section of a news story, you know that it's people that you're passing every day. Right, which creates, it's, so you're like, wow, that could be my student, or wow, that could be someone. And so I could only stay on there a very short, a limited amount of time because I realized that the longer I was there, I was exposed to this kind of unvarnished intellectual racism, like, I don't know what, how else to describe it. Um, I would not want to teach these people. <laughs> it was creating in me um, a kind
kind of uh, lack of trust and, and reciprocity in that. And so I kind of logged out. But in that vignette, I talk about one of my students writing a, a news story for the Princeton, the, the student paper, about Yik Yak. And his analysis in just a few sentences really um, illustrates the larger point of the book in which he said, we just can't get rid of the app. And we just can't sort of tweak it so certain content can't be on it. We have to think about the larger context in which these ideas are enabled and allowed to flourish. And so he gives in a, in a little, and it's a white student, interestingly, who's been in solidarity with, with the black student movement that was happening at the time, who came to this conclusion that just trying to create a technical fix, getting the ideas out of sight, out of mind, without tackling the underlying um, milieu, which gives rise to it, won't serve us in, in the end. And so I thought that was such a, um, a, a sophisticated way of thinking about, like, what do we do about the racist content of this app? The other thing I wanted to point to here is, and it goes to your question about what does it mean for those who are immersed in technology in this way? And there's two, two examples, and there's many more we could talk about, but just a, a year ago, Brooklyn students walked out uh, of their school because they um, were used, had been uh, forced to use a Facebook produced software program in their schools in which they got 15 to 20 minutes of teacher time a week and were otherwise interacting with this, with this software. And they decided this is not real education. <laughs> and we're walking out and we reject it. So it's a, one of many examples of a kind of informed refusal that I think we might assume that you know, young people who you know, are you know, so tech savvy or whatever um, would be less critical. But in fact, it's almost like being inundated from every side with this techno-utopian vision that you know, you know, just replace everything with technology and we'll be great. <laughs> um, they're actually saying no. Similarly, in this town in Kansas, it was not just the students, but the parents, the whole town rose up against the school board for just adopting without, without public debate a particular program. It was having all kinds of um, adverse effects on kids with disabilities and you know, all kinds of emotional things that, that, the peop that it wasn't part of the marketing, obviously, of the software. And so for, I think the most surprising thing, perhaps this is where I'll end the formal part of our discussion, is that at the time that I started this book to now, for me, the public awareness, consciousness, conversation has shifted dramatically. It could be in part Cambridge Analytica, the political things that have happened as well, but I thought when I started this project in 2016 that I would have to be much more on the defensive in terms of bringing up like, technology might not save us guys. Like, <laughs> like and then, like, <laughs> but now I feel like everywhere I go, people are like, oh, hey, you know, like they're they're surpassing my critique, and I'm like, okay, it's not it's not that it's not going to save us or it's going to slay us. It's something in the middle, you know. Like so, we have to take back our agency, and so that's a caution that we have a tendency to either go in either extreme, a kind of techno utopian vision, which I think we've moved away from, which is you know just just add tech and stir. Versus a kind of techno dystopian vision that you know tech is going to take all the jobs, it's going to do all this bad stuff, like a way in which tech is going to slay us, and that also is a deterministic way of thinking, as if we are not in control, that we don't have agency, that the humans are not doing the designing. And so I would caution against either extreme, in so far as they're both deterministic and they lose the way in which human beings, our own values, desires, judgments are being. Um, replicated. And so, um, again, going back to our bodies ourselves, I don't think we need to be paranoid, but we have to recognize our power and exercise it in a way that is empowering. Thank you so much for your time.